Welcome to a new theme. Today we're talking about change management in food manufacturing. And as you all know, I'm, I trust you've been watching this uh, video series for a period of time and seen many of the different videos. Uh, a lot of the work that I do personally is focused on innovation practice within food companies. And innovation practice could be through new product development. It could be through organizational management. It could be through uh, development of startups. It could also be through food safety. And every one of those core themes at its root really focuses on change. The fact that it may be something brand new starting from scratch. It could be taking old systems that aren't working so well and finding new ways of doing things. And so change management is something that I'm really excited about. And as such, I'm excited to do this next series of videos with you. So at the end of this video, yeah, there's a lot of words, don't worry, we will get to this. And you know my approach, it's always going to be on an outcomes basis and to really hone in on the plain language, common sense outcomes for this. So we are going to discuss the Kubler-Ross change curve and identify behaviors and mindsets related to innovation and change within organizations. We're then going to define Hofstede's cultural dimensions and identify how these are demonstrated in organizations as part of their ability to manage change. Yeah, it's a lot of theory, but we will figure it out and it will start to make sense. Then we're going to explain how cultural and communications dynamics within organizations can impact the organization's ability to face problems and encourage change both in a positive or negative way. We're going to identify change management integration with Six Sigma methodology using ADGAR. And those of you who are following along in my process engineering course know that we have spent the past while measuring Six Sigma, Six Sigma or using Six Sigma and DMAIC tools. Well, change management can be man managed through DMAIC, but it's more commonly used in a tweaked form called ADCAR. Last but not least, we'll apply W. Edwards Deming's 14 points to change management, and you know I'm a huge fan. So We'll carry on here. So the Kubler-Ross change curve. Kubler-Ross uh, was a psychologist who actually was studying grief and the change processes behind grief. But bit by bit, the models that were developed by Kubler-Ross were adapted into management and organizational management. And the idea being that when you are faced with a problem within your organization, you can go through different stages of facing that problem. And so in the beginning, you might be just denying that there's a problem there at all. You may just be frustrated by the problem, but not feel that you have any capability to deal with it. And therefore you start to ignore it and go back up the slope to denial. You could be just dis dis depressed and angry and frustrated and um, act out because of it. And then moving into positive change, you may be in a space where you're encouraged to experiment and identify new strategies. And in really good change integrated organizations, they will have clear communications pathways about how change is managed and show how decisions are made and be able to focus on clear decision making practices. And so this change curve, while uh, originally based off of experiences of understanding human grief, can also be reframed to organizations. And when we, when we talk about organizations, we're talking about teams within companies. We can also talk about different subgroups, so different, um, different smaller teams. We can, even, we can even think about it on an individual level. And what are your individual perceptions of, of problems? When you see a problem, do you run away from it? Do you see a problem? Do you see it as an opportunity for change and an opportunity for um, building up your team and creating better communications pathways? That Kubler-Ross change curve is really foundational in terms of thinking about the emotional aspect of change. Not everyone wants to change. And so that's something that needs to be... Um, built into deliberate leadership within change management. Next, we're gonna talk about Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Now, Hofstede, Geert Hofstede was a, a Dutch organizational psychologist and he um, did his work with IBM initially 
he was working with uh, within the organizational development group at IBM and trying to figure out why different international um, different international teams worked completely differently. And he built out this matrix. This was built out in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And he was framing it based off of cultural dimensions. So he would go into a team within, uh, let's say, Eastern Europe as compared to North America, as compared to Asia, and look at the cultural dimensions. Now, since his work in the 1950s, 1960s, a lot of a lot of this has come down to actual um, uh, critique against Hofstede's uh, work is that these cultural dimensions are actually not macro. You can't just go and say, well, people from one country act this way and people from another country act a different way. Hofstede's cultural dimensions are still interesting, though, because of the cultural dimensions that are set up within organizations and how organizations articulate the different dimensions within them. So let's just walk through and parse through each of these different dimensions. A power distance index, in when we apply it with a, with a modern lens, what we are looking at is how far or close are the workers who see the problems, how, how far away or close are they relationally to the people who can make change within the organization. So I think about some organizations that I've worked with where you have to submit a form and wait for an answer and then that form gets sent to someone else and you wait for an answer and meanwhile it would be just so convenient if you could just walk into that person's office the person who's going to get the form after five past hands five times and just say here's the problem let's work on this that's what we consider a linear hierarchy within the organization do you have to go through that sort of chain of command or can within the organizations is the capability of discussing immediately with the right change agents. And I can understand conversely why there may be need for some level of hierarchy. In many organizations, there needs to be a sense of data collection and a sense of intent behind why everyone has those roles. But um, organizations that are effective at change reduce the power distance between the people who observe the problems and the people who are able to mobilize resources to change the problems. Secondly, we've got individualism versus collectivism. And so using a modern lens on Hofstede's theory, how do organizations appreciate success? So when I see organizations that go out and um, clap people on the back for the work that they're doing and exclude other people in the process as compared to doing team-based appreciation, that's one aspect of it. Are goals that are set within the organization set based off of individuals' priorities or are they set as institutional and collective organizational goals so that everyone has a role to play in terms of achieving that goal? If, if the goals are too narrow and isolate, individuals from participating, it can also, it can almost uh, garner resentment within the team. Last but not least, um, in terms of individualism versus collectivism, is there a clique-based culture or an old boys type of spheres of influence within organizations such that some people are able to participate in change because they look a certain way or act a certain way or a certain gender or are of a certain cultural background as compared to having clearly defined organizational roles and organizational charts so that it's not who you know and who you eat lunch with, or if you are a man or if you are a woman that allows you to be able to make a decision, but instead it is your job function to be part of that entire decision-making team. So again, good change-oriented organizations have more of this... Um, collectivist-based approach to how they are um, mobilizing change. Because if you think about having everyone mobilized and motivated, change is easier to adopt and adapt to. Um, this one's interesting, masculinity versus femininity. And again, as I mentioned before, Hofstede's theory has had a lot of different uh, modern interpretations and a lot of modern dissent. But 
you could argue that within certain organizations, there's masculine-based um, approaches to organizational attributes. So things like emphasizing achievement, emphasizing winning, emphasizing personal gain and material reward. And those were what uh, Hofstede considered masculine organizational attributes. And then he had what he considered uh, feminine organizational attributes, things like collaboration, collective success, mentorship, personal satisfaction, and work-life balance. And I can't say that one or the other is necessarily better. It's very important for organizations to have clear purpose and strive towards achievement. But when that achievement is done for select individuals, it can be uh, disincentivizing. People don't want to work if only a few people are reaping benefit. And so, um, likewise, too, I think there's been a major shift within organizations to understand the role of uh, mentorship and work-life balance as part of the success metric. When people are feeling good walking into the workplace because they're appreciated as part of a team, then they're more likely to achieve their best within the workplace and work towards that collective success. So some things to think about there. Uncertainty avoidance index. This one's a fun one. And I think Michael Feistauer and his hot dog car. <laughs> I love this photo. It's one of my favorites. Um, within some organizations and within organizational teams, some people avoid uncertainty. They like protocol and procedure. They like to be given instructions. They like to know there's a way of doing it and it must be done that way. And that is challenging within a change, which in, within a change framework, because chaos happens. Murphy's law happens, and and the challenge within these uh, organizations that have a really rigid framework is that scenarios outside of the norms are very difficult to deal with. And so, there are times and places for uncertainty avoidance um, within a lot of government. There's a huge uncertainty avoidance uh, preference. They want to have very clear. Um, defined roles and um, clear defined ways of doing things because it makes sure that ambiguity doesn't cloud the picture. But the reality is there's a lot of uncertainty within innovation. And so um, within a lot of innovative organizations, there's the capability of embracing uncertainty, focusing on root cause and really honing in on what is the core fundamental of the of the challenge that needs to be solved so that we can find new and alternative ways of solving the problem? High uncertainty um, acceptance allows for some chaos, but at the same time, there needs to be a really fine um, approach to it that chaos can quickly overwhelm a system and there's no organization, um, there's no organization, there's no procedures, there's no policies or... Um, practices in place. And so it's a balancing act between the two in this. But organizations that embrace innovation have a much higher ability to embrace uncertainty. Short-term versus long-term orientation. And so in um, organizations that have good orientation towards um, innovation, they tend to have a good balance between the ability to focus on the now and focus on immediately getting stuff done that needs to be done putting out fires, getting uh, getting things done, but also a balance between that and long-term with clear focus on a future goal, what those plans are going to be and the contingencies to get there, and uh, uh, fostering learning and growth mindsets that uh, the people within the organization are going to change their, um, change their goals and perceptions of how they want to work, um, the, the types of outcomes that the organization has, may change over time. And as such, there needs to be that balancing act between the two with really clearly articulated and mutually shared long-term goals, as well as let's get her done on the day-to-day -day operations. And the last index within Hofstede's uh, framework is indulgent attitudes versus restraint attitudes. And within organizations, there is time to have fun and there's time to, um, pardon me, but break the rules. There's time to run budgets down because it's the right thing to do. And you want to have a corporate culture that appreciates appreciates people and has fun and doesn't just uh, restrain people and make them into miserable 
people, but at the same time, restraint also means having personal etiquette or ethics, not eth etiquette. <laughs> having some etiquette too is good, uh, but having personal ethics, integrity, um, and being able to make hard decisions when it's necessary. There's a balancing act between the two in that I've seen innovation cultures where they just go and blow budgets um, because they say, well, this is the way that 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 change occurs by making everyone happy and putting in fancy coffee machines and going on uh, study tours to random places um, versus having some sort of fiscal restraint to be able to get things done. What's the most challenging is when um, indulgence becomes a personal habit where you, you say, you know what, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to play hooky on a Friday and not get things done. Or I'm going to um, do a, do the bare minimum on my work because, hey, no one's watching. Stuff like that falls into this indulgent versus restraint aspect. And it's important to foster a culture that is able to walk in and say, you know what, here's here's what we expect of our organization and how we're going to both appreciate you and enjoy the workplace, as well as make sure that we've got good uh, corporate policies in place. I put in this diagram because all of those cultural dynamics then start to fall into language patterns. And this is important to think about that within, I'm, I, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but Hofstede's dynamics did have a lot of implications within multinational teams. What, what we see in Canada, and, I, and I'm based in Canada, is that we are so fortunate to have a really, um, really strategic immigration policy, and we bring in students from around the world, we bring in skilled workers from around the world who contribute extremely important roles in our food manufacturing sector. And as such, we have a very multi uh, multinational approach. It's important to think about what sort of structures are in place. Do you have formal assignments for roles? Do you have job descriptions? Do you have cohesive uh, uh, rules and responsibilities and procedures within the organization so that you know what is done. But at the same time, when you have people come in with expertise, are you taking advantage and using it to the best of people's ability? I've seen so many um, amazing young workers come from all over the world, and many of them with masters and PhDs be put into entry-level roles. And that expertise that is rare and valuable is not being exploited by the organization. And it's really unfortunate that these individuals then are, are pigeonholed into certain roles and it becomes a frustration rather than an opportunity for growth. Um, working within the different languages that are out there is important and understanding the cultural dynamics of the language. Uh, my next slide is going to talk about uh, some of the cultural dynamics of, of that. But uh, at the same time, um, setting cultural dynamics and cultural norms, but at the same time embracing um, international and multicultural dynamics in a in a clear and fruitful way. So, for example, in my class, I have students from all sorts of different countries. I tell the students, I teach you in English. That is the framework. I I can talk to you in French. I will provide you advice. We can help you find tutoring and supports if you are having challenges with the language. And I also uh, record a lot of my lecture content so that they can run it through. Uh, closed captioning and translation. Um, that's a way that we are able to balance the cultural norms that are necessary for the function of our organization while still embracing positively the fact that um, language is still a barrier for participation and how can we reduce that barrier by using appropriate tools. In different cultures too, we have language structures that uh, indicate hierarchy. So in English, it's uh, We've, we've got a pretty relaxed basis in most organizations we speak uh, using first names. And within other cultural environments, people always have to go by professor or ma'am or doctor or mister or um, engineer this and lawyer that. Um, my, my spouse is Iranian, and when he goes and visits with his friends, he always goes and says, uh, more or less goes and greets everyone by Mr. Doctor, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Engineer, and and I and I, and then and then these men come over and say hi to me, and they say hello, wife of Hassan, and I'm like, wait a second, I should be hi, Professor Doctor Amy, 
<laughs> and and so the women we we tease each other because of that egalitarian aspect of what we've embraced here in North America. So I'm going to uh, skip ahead here because I don't want this to go too too long. But when working in organizations on change management, you do need to think about the behavioral aspects, both individually and within leadership roles. What are the sorts of behaviors that you are seeing, and how is consideration, consensus, and cooperation being incorporated, and openness, transparency, and uh, candidness in those communications? Because oftentimes within language, you'll see people either, the, the ideal situation for effective change management is to be in this assertive behavior quartile. Um, and I and I say quartile, I don't mean that 25% of people show assertive behavior and 25% are passive aggressive and so on. But this quartile is the ideal quartile where people are collaborative in decision making, there's clarity in communication, being clear is fair and clear is kind, to use a Brene Brown um, aphorism. People ask for what they need, people can make mistakes, they can move on positively, and they are able to participate in problem solving. These are the sorts of um, considerate and open, transparent practices that good change-oriented organizations uh, embrace. There are uh, situations where um, organizations have aggressive leadership and there's bullying and decision-making, there's unilateral communications. If you walk in and ask for something, you have no idea what you're going to get. Um, other viewpoints aren't necessarily embraced. And it's important to acknowledge what's out there and work towards changing towards a more assertive space. I work with a lot of young food scientists and Oftentimes they fall into this passive space. And again, I think that just comes from a lack of experience, but also a lack of awareness. Oftentimes they defer in communication. I, I see this with many students where they say, well, what do you think, professor? And I'm like, oh, well, I, I'm asking you, what do you think, actually? Because I want to see that you're growing and, and evolving in your mindset, but also being able to assert your ideas within a group. And in the case of my classroom... I will often say, no, I don't want I don't want to tell you what the answer is. I want you to tell me what the answer is. And then they'll they'll just hide in the back corner. The inability to make decisions, part of it just comes from youth and uh, lack of experience. But in some in some cultural dynamics, there's pressure to not make decisions. And organizations have either uh, beat it out of people where you walk in there and say, here's an idea that I'd like to do. And time and time again, you're turned down. Well, that can push you into a passive behavior or actually into a passive aggressive behavior. If you're fearful and hide from mistake because of uh, punishment or feel that there's no opportunity for you to contribute and control anything, then that encourages a lot of passive behavior. And again, not, not positive when it comes to change management. And the worst one is the passive aggressive behavior. And that's where within, um, within organizations, you, you see people say one thing and then completely different behavior, lack of clarity in communications, lack of transparency in decision making. There's lots of hidden agendas and grudges and lack of clarity, blaming others for mistakes and no apologies out there or, or a doubling down on blaming rather than apologizing. These are really negative when it comes to change management because it's, it's a disincentive to participate in that sort of space. Adcar, Adcar. Oh, wait a second. We've, we've seen Demaic before, all of you folks who are taking process engineering. Um, Adcar really hones in on that same aspect of if you're defining something, you're aware of it. If you want to measure it, you are going to desire it and figure out some sort of goal that allows you to measure that you are meeting that desired future state. Analyze is where you're collecting the knowledge to determine what solution is the appropriate solution in terms of organizational strategy. Improving is where you're going out and increasing people's ability or implementing solutions. And then you're going to reinforce those sorts of behaviors and roles through control. Demaic totally fits into change management. And ADCAR is just another, uh, another term to put out there, but wait a second, everything goes back to W. Edwards Deming. And yeah, I, I, I admit I 
really do like W. Edward Stemming's work. And honestly, what is this cycle? Both of these are just PDSA cycles. They're just PDSA cycles at the real root of it. Do you have a clear idea of what you want to do? Can you figure out and uh, figure out a strategy or plan? Go and measure what you need to do and then go and enact the change that you want to do. Everything goes back to that. Last but not least, let's uh, leave you with W. Edward Stemming, 14 points um, for total quality management. You'll notice in his writing on the 14 points for quality management, so many of them relate back to um, innovation practice and change management. Create purpose for improvement. Adopt new philosophies. Cease dependence on inspection to achieve quality. Well, that that may be a little less because that's where he's he's focusing on going back to the root cause and um, have preventive measures rather than inspection to meet quality. Work with one supplier, not so much, but um, and this one may be out of date with COVID in place, but continuous improvement, totally about change management, totally about um, improving purpose. On the job training, all about change management. Leadership, all about change management. Drive out fear, absolutely. Break down silos, no slogans, no quotas. Remove annual ratings or merit systems. Why? Because it's all about collectivism. It's all about everyone with the same goal rather than giving bonuses to just a few select people. Self uh, or Institute education and self-improvement. Oh, totally about change management and involve all workers in the transformation. W. Edward Stemming, all about change management. And so I totally encourage you to think about, think about how you are embracing organizational habits, either on your own to improve your ability to be a change manager or a change leader, but also think about the teams that you're in and think about the sorts of things. I realize that a lot of you may be students watching these videos, but you may be working part-time or getting a co-op or getting that first job. What are the sorts of um, small behaviors that you can start to role model within your organization to enact the types of change that you would like to see at a higher level? I want to make sure that uh, so many of the people who reach out to me say, oh, I, I would love to have a mentorship conversation, just a Skype call or a phone call with you to talk about some of the situations that I'm in and get some advice. And a lot of it goes back to change management and, and, and building up leadership capacity. Um, and honestly, being aware is the first part of change management. Knowing what the systems look like allow you to know what you need to know so that you can go and do your best. So we'll leave you with that. It is not enough to do your best. You must know what you need know what to do and then do your best and so if you've got some frameworks to work from you're going to do even better and I'm cheering for you I'm going to give you a virtual pat on the back I'm sure W. Edward Stemming is going to give you a pat on the back as well and keep on working towards learning something new every day take care and we'll talk to you soon